Today's teaching text comes from Jonah 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thanks, Rachel. Well, hey, good to be back up here two minutes later. Um, man, super good to be with you guys. I, uh, I stayed out way too late last night at the Charlotte FC game, and so I'm going to need you to help me say some amens. Thank you. Um, Jonah chapter 3. If you got a Bible, go to Jonah chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, uh, there's some on the ends of each row. If you don't own a Bible, that's our gift to you. Feel free to take that home, read it, uh, and I think you'll encounter Jesus uh, and the beauty of the gospel in it. So take that read it. But if, uh, if you would, Jonah chapter 3, let me pray once again for us just to ask God to, to move and to, to send his spirit and power as we think about Jonah 3 and all the, the fun we're going to have in this story. Let's pray. God, thank you once again for, for who you are and that we get to be here, that we get to open your scriptures that you have given to us and that you've preserved and that you've kept, that you've revealed yourself in. And I pray as we think about Jonah 3, as we think about Nineveh, as we think about the world's worst prophet and his incredible story of running from you and your incredible display of mercy after mercy after mercy. God, I pray that we would just not just encounter some good ideas, or some good philosophies, or so, some good life hacks, Lord, that we would encounter you. Now, would you open our eyes to the living God? We need you. We love you. God, would you not let your word return void, but would it bear fruit in our lives? Pray all these things in Christ's name and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Well, here's where I want to start. There are two people in your life who will have your unreserved yes. There are two people in your life who will have your unreserved yes, who you will say yes to no matter what they ask. The first is your authority. Now, I don't mean your authority like they have the role over you. I mean who you actually think is your authority. Growing up, the authority in my life was a man by the name of Dave Olson. That's my dad. And Dave was the authority, not just in our household, but also among our group of friends, because he was also our coach in multiple sports that we all played together. And so I knew, my siblings knew, and our friends knew that when Dave is around and when Dave is in the room, Dave is the authority. Remember one story in particular, when I was, I think, in eighth grade or so, we uh, took a trip, my brothers and a group of our friends from Aiken, South Carolina, where I grew up, to Augusta, Georgia. Because when you're a teenager in Aiken, that's what you do. You go to Augusta, because Augusta has a mall, and in that mall was Hot Topic and Pack Sun. And so you go, and you get the band t-shirts, and you're looking cool for school on Monday. That rhymed. That was awesome. And so we went to Augusta, and we're on the way back, and we had two friends in particular who were twins who were just known for, like, not taking care of things. They just, if, if they drove something, they crashed it. If you let them borrow something, they broke it. That was just those twins. So we're on the way back from the mall. 
and they didn't see that there was a stop sign, and my brother stopped, and they did not, and they rear-ended my, my brother's car. And so we finished the drive home. He calls my dad. Hey, this is what happened. Who was it? Oh, that guy. Yep, it was that guy. Sorry. And we get into the driveway, and us and all of my friends and all of our friends pull into the driveway, and Dave comes out. And not angrily, not with a yelling tone, just with a sternness that you know who's the authority. And he says this, I still remember it like it was yesterday. He said, if your last name is not Olson, you need to leave now. And I've never seen 16-year-old guys move as fast as they did in that moment because they knew Dave's the authority. There are two people in your life who will have your unreserved yes. The first is your authority. The second is your love. Your love. I saw this all of the time in college, right? You would be friends with these guys for two or three years, and it's like, man, for three years, all you have worn are sweatpants and stained hoodies, right? Like, I don't think you've showered in the last three years. I don't know what's going on with your hair. And then suddenly, they, like, show up the next day, and they're wearing, like, chinos and a sweater. And you're like, what happened to you? Like, you are dressed normally, and you showered. And they're like, well, I met a girl, and she really likes it. And you're like, no, say no more. I got you. There are two people in your life who will have your unreserved yes, your authority and your love. In the whole course of the first two chapters of Jonah, God is trying to reteach Jonah, Jonah, who is your authority and who is your love? And over and over again in this story, he has continually tried to call Jonah back to this reality. I am your authority. I control everything. The wind and the waves, the sea, everything is under my authority, and I love you. And so I'm doing whatever it takes to get you to love me in return. And this is the consistent theme we've seen in the book of Jonah so far, right? That Jonah is consistently rebellious, and God is consistently gracious, it's this story of all of scripture, of all of our lives, right? Running and chasing sin and grace, God pursuing us and us in our hard-hearted rebellion, wanting to run from him. Now, while that's the, the big theme that we've been exploring over the past two weeks, though, it kind of takes a little bit of a turn in chapter three, because what we're going to see tonight in chapter three is that while God is chasing Jonah, he's also using Jonah to chase others, in fact, he's not just chasing Jonah for Jonah's sake. He has much more that he wants to do, not just in Jonah, but actually through Jonah. And so all this storyline in Jonah is God consistently being gracious to this world's worst prophet. He's not just being gracious to Jonah. He wants to be gracious through Jonah to other people, specifically here to the city of Nineveh. So in all of this, what God is going after in the storm, in the sailors, in the fish, all of this is that God is after Jonah's yes. God's been saying, Jonah, I'm showing you, I'm the authority. Jonah, I want your love because ultimately I want your yes. What I mean by that is he wants Jonah's obedience. God has put a call on the life of Jonah to go and preach to the Ninevites, and he will do whatever it takes to get Jonah's yes. So here's what I want to do. I want to walk through Jonah chapter 3, like we've been doing during the course of this series. I just want to kind of pull out some things from the text, from the story, and then I want to kind of spend the rest of our time applying it into our lives. So Jonah chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 1. It says this, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. If you're the type who likes to write in your Bible or underline it, you can highlight that phrase. It's so powerful. It's really the gospel on display in just the first line of Jonah chapter 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Now that is shocking because God should have given up on Jonah by now, right? But he didn't. Hard-hearted, rebellious, stubborn Jonah, and yet God says, no, Jonah, I've got a call on your life. He gives him a do-over. He gives him a second chance. And look at what he says. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Now, if that sounds like deja vu, it's because it is. This is what he, God said to Jonah in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, right? Look at this. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. Whenever this takes place in the Hebrew Old Testament, it's a marked do-over in the mind of the people of God. It's a one-for-one one trying to show God is not giving up on Jonah. Yeah, Jonah has been terrible. Yes, he's been on the run. Yes, he's like barely repentance-ish, if you remember last week. And God is going, no, the call is the same. Go to Nineveh. 
Go to Nineveh and preach. Go to Nineveh and give them the message that I've given you. Verse 3. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. Good job, Jonah. <laughs> the complete opposite again of chapter 1. This time it's reversed, right? In chapter 1, Jonah arose and went, nope, I'm going to Tarshish. Chapter 3, Jonah arose and he goes to Nineveh. Now on the surface, this is awesome, but in light of what we saw in chapter 2 last week, and I'm going to argue again in chapter 4 next week, it's better to think of this less like full-hearted obedience and more like um, shr- shoulder-shrugging obligation. So he's not still repentant fully. He's not like, yes, I'm on board with God. We're going to see this in a second. Kind of think of it like, all right, God, enough. I'll do what you want. Just leave me alone. That's the general posture going on in the heart of Jonah. And that becomes really clear in a second when we see his sermon. Keep going. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. All right, pause there. This is the world's worst sermon ever. I mean, I'm annoyed as a reader, right? It's like two chapters of suspense, right? We've been on the hook for two weeks. This guy's been on the run. There was a storm. They cast lots. They tossed him overboard. A fish swallowed him. Finally, he's going to Jonah, and he shows up and goes, hey, 40 days, and this whole thing's going to be done. Eight words in English, five in the original Hebrew text. A five-word sermon. Can you imagine how upset you would be if you dragged yourself to church on a Sunday at 5 p.m., and I gave you an eight-word sermon? Can you imagine? Like Rachel gets up and she reads Jonah 3, and then I stand up and say, hey, by the way, God's angry with you. Soon you'll be destroyed. I just walked off. (laughs) That you're not coming back, probably, for good reason, right? This is a terrible sermon. It further shows the heart posture of Jonah towards these people. It's not, yes, let's do it, God. I am in on your purposes. I am in on your call and plan. No, he's like, okay, how do I do the bare minimum just to get God off of my back? which says something about the way we often treat obedience as well, right? How do I do the base level minimum? How do I just do enough to just get God to leave me alone? So Jonah walks into the city. He says his five words in Hebrew, his eight words in English. He didn't speak English. It's just the translation, just so we're clear. But look at what happens. Verse five, and the people of Nineveh believed God. That's incredible. Eight words and a city that we'll find out is 120,000 people deep believe God. Look at what happens. They called for a fast, and they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat in ashes. So here's the king of one of the greatest cities of the capital of one of the greatest empires in the known world at that time, and he humbles himself and repents. It says he puts on sackcloth. It's this uh, outward display where he takes off his kingly robes and says, I'm not worthy to wear those. And instead, I'm going to wear sackcloth as this kind of physical sign of repentance. And then he sits in ashes. It's this sign of brokenness. He's lamenting. He's full of sorrow for his sin and wickedness. But he doesn't stop there. Look at verse 7. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and the violence that is in his hands. This is Old Testament repentance language. He says to turn. You're going this way in your life. You're living violent and evil. Turn from that and towards God. Verse 9, who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. So not only does the king of the Ninevites repent, but he leads the entire city into a time of repentance. Even the animals. He's like, let's just include them just in case. Let's just be safe here. Animals, you guys kind of repent too. We all got to repent. And it's fascinating because it says from the least of these to the greatest. So from the king to the lowest of servant and everyone in between, the king says, hey, we have rebelled and sinned against God. We're going to repent. And it's meant as kind of this another moment, another moment of irony in the book of Jonah, just like we talked about how this book's kind of full of irony. And it's meant to be a juxtaposition between the repentance of Jonah and the repentance of the Ninevites. 
So where Jonah repents falsely with much pride and much bravado, the Ninevites repent fully and completely. They put on sackcloth. They sit in ashes. Their entire posture is one of humble repentance. Where Jonah remains hard-hearted through a storm and through a near-death experience, through living in a fish's belly for three days, and he's still not willing to fully repent, the Ninevites repent quickly at an eight-word sermon from a foreign prophet. Where the pagan sailors worship God despite the actions and words of Jonah, the pagan Ninevites worship God because of the actions and words of their king. It's meant to be this irony as you read it, as an Old Testament Israelite would have read it in the ancient world, they would have read it and said, oh man, we think we're close to God, but these people are the ones who get repentance. They understand it. They know their need for the Lord. Then look how it closes, verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. I think if you could summarize chapter 3 in a sentence, it would be this. Jonah gave the Ninevites a half-hearted sermon, but God gave the Ninevites full-hearted forgiveness. Jonah gave the Ninevites a half-hearted sermon. Eight words, here you go, you're going to be overthrown, best of luck to you. Yet God gave them full-hearted forgiveness. It's this beautiful moment once again where the mercy of God is on display. So that's chapter three. Uh, It's got a really weird ending next week, so uh, please be be around. I know it's holiday weekend, but it's really fascinating, Jonah 4. But that's where I want to stop tonight. Let me just think about how to apply it into our lives. What can we learn from chapter three, 3,000 years later here in the secular West? I think we should wrestle in light of this chapter with two questions. That's kind of where I just want to sit for the rest of our time together. Two questions I think this chapter makes us all answer and wrestle with. The first is this, do you believe the mercy of God is great enough to save sinners? It's the first question you have to wrestle with coming out of Jonah 3. Do you believe the mercy of God is great enough to save sinners? You can't read the book of Jonah without seeing this continual message that God's heart is to save those who are far from him. We see this in the life of Jonah consistently as God pursues him and pursues him and pursues him. And now we see it in chapter 3 in the life of Nineveh. So to get this, let's spend a little bit of time talking a little more about Nineveh. So Nineveh, as Jonah has told us already, is a great city. And that's kind of an understatement. So Nineveh is the capital city of Assyria. And Assyria was kind of the ancient uh, global power in this time. And they built Nineveh not just as kind of the center of commerce and trade, but actually as a status symbol. They said, we want to develop this city, Nineveh, in such a way that when people see Nineveh, they'll be like, well, we know who's in charge, and it's the Assyrians. Like, that's what they wanted out of this city. But not only is it great, it's exceedingly wicked and evil. One historian says this about Nineveh. He says, Nineveh was the cruelest, vilest, most powerful, most idolatrous empire in the world. It was a city full of sexual immorality and prostitution, idolatry and corruption. They were known for their violence and cruelty. We talked about this in week one, that when they conquered another nation, they would cut everyone's heads off, men, women, and children. And they would pile it at the gate to that conquered city to basically say, we're in charge. Remember, don't mess with us. They were known as a city for daily executions in the public square. They would gather everyone together on a daily basis to light people on fire that they didn't like. They were violent and cruel. Nahum, who's another Old Testament prophet a little after Jonah, calls it the city of blood. So they're violent, they're wicked, they're evil, full of idolatry and and sexual morality and corruption. But not only that, to make matters worse, they're also extremely arrogant. A few years ago, archaeologists unearthed some ancient writings from some Ninevite kings, and they found one in particular from a king named Asharshadon. And they don't know if it's journal or public decree, but it's very fascinating. This is what they read. They they found it, and then they, they deciphered it, interpreted it, and this is what they found. He writes, I am powerful. I am all-powerful, I'm a hero, I'm gigantic, I'm colossal, I am honored, I am magnified, I'm without equal, I'm the chosen one. Which is like ancient rap, I'm down with it, I get it, sounds great. Arrogant, boastful, proud, violent, immoral, idolatrous, corrupt, and yet get this, not outside of the reach of the mercy of God. 
I mean, I don't know how you get more evil than just deciding you're going to kill everyone when you conquer them and then pile their heads up in a pile. And yet God goes, when they repent, I relent. It's that simple. His mercy extends even to Nineveh. And they're reading this, ancient Israelites would have been reading this, and this would have been a gut punch to their pride because they have categories for them not being outside the mercy of God. They have categories because they're, you know, we're God's chosen people, we're, we follow him, we obey his laws, we do the sacrifices, we do all these things. But the Ninevites, they're outside the mercy of God, and God goes, no, not at all. When they repent, I bring mercy, I bring forgiveness, I bring grace. This is the, the heartbeat of God. All throughout the scriptures, this refrain beats over and over and over again the grace of God for sinners, the grace of God for sinners, the grace of God for sinners. That's the story of the scriptures. That's the story of our lives. That's the story of our world, that God will not leave us in our sin. It's the beauty of the gospel, that when this people, these people repent, God's like, yeah, my mercy goes that far. So if you're here in the room let me ask you to wrestle with this question. Do you believe the mercy of God is great enough to save sinners? So if you're not a Christian, right, you're here and you're here because you're exploring the teachings of Jesus or you're here because somebody invited you or you're here because you wandered in on the way to some other place in Plaza Midwood and you're like, this sounds cool or anywhere in between. I don't know your past and I don't know your history. I don't know what you've lived through. I don't know what you've done. I don't know what's been done to you. But let me just encourage you to not believe the lie that what you have not stumbled your way into in Citizens Church is a group of people who are simply upright, moral, celebrating how good we are people. It's not what you've walked into. You've not walked into a group of people who are more cleaned up than you. You've not walked into a group of people who live better lives than you. You've not walked into a group of people who are just here celebrating that we're awesome and that we follow a bunch of rules. That's not what we're doing. And I don't know your story, and I don't know the intricacies of it, and I don't know the ins and outs of what you've done or what's been done to you. I don't know the shame you carry. I don't know the disgrace that you want to own. I don't know the labels you want to wear, but here's what I do know. No one is outside the saving mercy of God. And so what you've walked into is a group of people who are jacked up and broken and suffering and struggling and full of sin and pain and addiction and idolatry. And I don't mean five years ago. I mean like this morning or like 4.30 p.m. or like 5.40. Gathering together saying we have no hope but Jesus. Gathering together, echoing the words of the disciples when God says, do you want to abandon me too? And Jesus says, are you going to leave? And they say, Lord, where else are we going to go? You have the words of life. We know how messed up we are. We know how broken we are. We know how, how brutal our lives have been because of things we've done and things been done to us. And yet our only hope that we rest in and celebrate every time we gather that the mercy of God is great enough to save even us. Even me even you. That's the promise of the scriptures. That's the invitation of Jesus. The mercy of God is great enough to save even you, and that's put on display the working of God, his never-endingness, such that he would send Jesus 2,000 some odd years ago to be the only one who did not live the messed up broken life. To be the only one who lived the perfect life, following all his commands and all his laws and all his statutes and all of God's design for human flourishing. Jesus lived all of it, and yet he who was without sin, the Bible says, became sin. He actually took our rebellion, our sin, on himself, on this ancient torture device known as a cross, to die the death that we and our sins deserved. To save us. And this is the promise of Romans. Romans says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from your sin? Saved from yourself? Saved from the very just wrath of God? That's the promise of the scriptures, that you will be saved saved. The mercy of God is not too far out of reach. And so I would plead with you like I do every Sunday. I'm going to be down front. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to follow Jesus. But here's what you have to understand. You need the urgency that this message requires, just like the king of Nineveh. 
Jonah shows up to the Ninevites, and he's like, 40 days, and Nineveh's going to be overthrown. And the king goes, we're all repenting. Every single one of us, sackcloth and ashes, because this is not okay. We have to turn back to God. And so I would plead with you, don't play with the goodness of God offered to you forever in patience. Because that forever has a limit. One day we're going to die. And one day we'll stand before the Lord, and the scriptures say that every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So I'd ask you to believe that you're not too far past the goodness of God. Now, if you're a Christian in the room, let me ask you the same question. Do you believe the mercy of God is great enough to save sinners? What I mean by that is, one, do you think you're past the need for the mercy of God? Are you like, yeah, 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 those people. Yeah, 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 Ninevites, oh, yeah, mercy. But me, mm, I'm pretty good. But second, do you believe the mercy of God is great enough to save that person you've written off? That person that you've just decided for them, they're never going to become a Christian. That person that you've just decided for them, they're never going to believe. Maybe these people, they might believe, but like my brother, mm mm-mm. My sister, no way. My neighbor, mm mm-mm. Outside the mercy of God, I've just decided for him. Nineveh, yeah, that's cool, but that was like 3,000 years ago. These people, mm mm-mm. Do you believe the mercy of God is great enough to save sinners? And who have you written off? I, what I didn't mention about the story of Nineveh that I think is so fascinating is what's happening leading up to Jonah arriving. So on the one hand, you have Jonah preaching an eight-word sermon and then repenting. On the other hand, historians account for what's happening in the city of Nineveh leading up to this. And in the years leading up to Jonah's arrival, the Ninevites had experienced two natural phenomenons. The first is plagues, and the second is a solar eclipse. And you're like, that sounds awesome. What does that have to do with anything? Well, here's what it has to do. In the ancient world, the Ninevites and the Assyrians believed that plagues and solar eclipses were evidence that the deities were mad at humanity for rebelling against their way. So track with this. Jonah shows up after years of them going, we think the gods are mad at us. And he says, hey, by the way, the one true God is mad at you. And here's how that applies to us. You have no idea the plagues and eclipses going on in people's lives that you've written off. You have no idea. You have no idea what God is doing behind the scenes, underneath the surface for days or months or weeks or years, preparing that person's heart for the good news of the gospel. And you've written them off and decided, no, there's no way they're going to believe. And God's going, I've been working on them for years, waiting on you to say yes, to take the gospel. All right, that's the first question. Let me... Let me go to the second. First question, do you believe the mercy of God is great enough to save sinners? Second question is this, are you willing to be used by God in his salvation plan? Are you willing to be used by God in his salvation plan? God in this entire story is after Jonah's heart. That's the big theme. Jonah's running, God is chasing, Jonah's rebelling, God is gracious. That's the whole argument of week one. Week two, God's continual mercy for Jonah, that he picked Jonah for a reason. But I think what's so striking to me about chapter three is that the story doesn't end after Jonah gets out of the fish. That's just fascinating to me, right? Like God's not like, okay, I kind of got a hold of your heart. Like I just wanted to make sure you were willing to go to Nineveh. No, what does he do? He doubles down. He's like, all right, this is cool. Good for you. You're actually willing to go now. Go. (laughs) I'm doubling down on the call on your life. You are supposed to go to Nineveh and preach the gospel. And this is the consistent theme of the scriptures, that God not only wants to save people, He does. Yes and amen. He wants to chase us, pursue us, call us his own, but it never ends there. The theme of the scriptures is that God pursues us, and then he calls us to join him in the pursuit of others. That's the constant refrain, that our God would seek us, call us his own, bring us into his family, and then send us to join him in bringing more into his family. This is how Paul puts it so clearly in 2 Corinthians 5. He says this, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, let me put it even more uh, simply than that. God saves us to send us. God saves us to send us. God saves you. He reconciles you to himself. He forgives you and washes you clean and makes you whole. And then he gives you the message of reconciliation. Or I don't know if this is a helpful analogy or not, but when you think about the grace of God, the grace of God is not a bucket, it's a hose. All right? Because here's what happens. We go, okay, I love the grace of God. He pursues me. Great. What do I do now? I just like read my Bible a bunch and like pray a bunch. And it's like me and God. No, the grace of God is not a bucket where it just sits with us. It's meant to be a hose. The grace of God goes through us. It doesn't stop with us. Let me say it even stronger. There is no category 
in the scriptures for a Christian who receives the gospel of Jesus and then does not live on mission sharing the gospel with those around them. There's no category in it. In fact, there's no category as well in the New Testament of a church, a group of Christ followers who are not actively engaged in working and praying for people in their city to come to Jesus. Just read the book of Acts. Read the rest of the New Testament after that, time and time again. To be a Christian is to be a sent one of God. I love the way J.D. JD Greer, he's a pastor in Raleigh, puts it so poignantly. He says this, he says, without the mission of God, a church is not a church. It's just a group of disobedient Christians hanging out. There's a lot of good things we can do. I like you guys. I'd love to hang out. But without the mission of God, it's just a group of disobedient Christians hanging out, which means if you're a Christian, you're either living your life on mission or disobeying God, one or the other. Because if you're saved, you're sent. And what I love about the story of Jonah is that it takes away all of our excuses for why we don't step into the mission of God. It takes away the competency excuse right? That excuse where we're like, I would share my faith, but I'm just nervous. I'm nervous that I would say the wrong thing, or they'd ask me a question I don't know, or they would talk about apologetics, and I'm just going to not portray the gospel accurately. Like, I'm just nervous. And what I love about Jonah is it's like, yeah, Jonah used an eight-word sermon, and 120,000 people repented. Because God works often despite of us, and sometimes often through our weaknesses. That he would actually take Jonah's brokenness and use that as a tool to lead the entire city of Nineveh to repentance, that it's God who saves. So the Lord belongs salvation. Remember Jonah's false repentance in, in Jonah chapter two, right? Salvation belongs to the Lord. He got a little bit right. It's God who saves. It's God who in Isaiah 55 says his word does not return void. Jonah takes away our excuse of sin and shame. I can't join the mission of God because you don't know who I've been. You don't know who I've been in the past. You don't know who I am in the present. I can't step into the mission of God. You don't understand my addiction. You don't understand my sin. You don't understand my struggle. You don't understand I'm not good. And mission of God is for the good Christians. Read Jonah 1 and 2. <laughs> Jonah is so rebellious against God, so hard-hearted, and yet he is the one God wants to use to bring Nineveh to repentance. Jonah takes away our excuse of rejection. Yeah, but Tim, I don't, I don't want them to reject me. I don't want them to say something bad about me. I don't want it to be weird. I don't want it to be awkward. I, don't, I want them to like me. I want to be friends. I don't want to share the gospel with them. I heard a, a pastor this week uh, getting ready for this sermon. Somebody said, what's your definition of evangelism? And he said, two people having a really awkward conversation. And I love Jonah because the Ninevites, one, would have cut his head off. Something to fear. But also there's an invitation that God would say, yeah, even if it's hard, I'm calling you to go. Because part of what it means to follow Jesus is to be willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel spreading to others. And so, yeah, they might, but it's worth it for my name. Jonah also takes away the excuse of apathy and laziness. I just don't really like those people. So those I like too much. That's why I don't want to tell them about Jesus. But these I don't like at all. That's why I don't want to tell them about Jesus. Jonah hated the Ninevites. They were his enemy for valid reasons. <laughs> they were his enemy. They wanted to take over the Israelites. They wanted to conquer them. Yet God says, no, you, for that very reason, you. And really, if I can take it even a layer below our excuses, I would say this, the excuses we give for not sharing the gospel are actually revealing of the idols of our hearts. Just sit on that for a second. Think about that. The excuses we give for not sharing the gospel reveal the idols of our hearts. So we say, I'm afraid of not being competent. I'm afraid of not saying the right thing. And what it reveals is that we love or need control. I got to be in control of the situation. I got to know exactly what to say, what exactly they're going to ask. I got to know exactly what to phrase it with. I got to be in control. We say, I can't share the gospel because of my sin and my shame. When really it reveals that we love and need power. I have to be a certain type of person. I have to posture myself in a certain way. I can't be weak. It's not through my weakness that God's going to bring the gospel to them. It's through my strength. I need to be strong. We say, I'm really afraid of rejection. I don't share the gospel because I'm afraid of what they're going to say about me. And it reveals that we love and need approval. I just can't. I don't know what I would do if they rejected me. I don't know what I would do if they didn't love me or think I'm awesome. We say, oh, I just am apathetic. I just can't, I can't care about it. I just don't have the desire to do it. And it reveals that we love and need comfort. The path of our lives is that of least resistance. And so I can bring it full circle from where we started about the story of my dad and who has your yes your authority and your love. I think what it boils down to is you think about this question, are you willing to be used by God in his salvation plan? I think the question is this, God is sending you, does he have your yes? 
To be a Christian is to be a sent one of God, that you have a mission in the world. Does he have your yes? And if he doesn't have your yes, then the follow-up question is, is he truly your God? Is he truly the one that is your authority? Is he truly the one that is your love? Because if he's your God, then he'll be both. And if he's both, then he'll have your unreserved yes. And so if God doesn't have your yes in joining him in his mission in the world, declaring the kingdom of God, bringing people to himself, chasing others down, could it be that you don't see him as your authority and your love? Could it be if you're wrecked with every excuse, incompetency, that you're afraid, that you're ashamed, that you're apathetic, that really the core level of what's happening is that we have replaced God with something else as our authority and our love. And why that matters is because on the one hand, the, the message of Jonah 3 is don't be like Jonah. That's like the really simple one, right? That's the one that just kind of hits you in the face. It's like, hey, Jonah's an idiot. Don't be like Jonah. (laughs) Let God use you. Like say yes to his mission. Say yes to the invitation that he has to to follow him and to join him in the, the work in the world to reconcile people to himself. And on the one hand, it's like, yes, that's the very simple surface level. Don't be like Jonah. Don't be rebellious and hard hearted. Let God use you. But in a whole nother level, the answer is not actually stop being like Jonah. It's start looking at Jesus because it's a worship issue. So we keep coming back to in this book of Jonah. It's a worship issue. Who is your authority and who is your love? Because there's two people in the world that will have your unreserved yes, your authority and your love. And so if you want to join God in his mission in the world and you're like, I'm apathetic or I'm nervous or I'm anxious or I just don't have time or whatever it may be, the answer is not simply to go, okay, Tim, stop being like Jonah. Fixed. It's not the answer. It's to look at Jesus, to fall more in love with him. To let him be what he wants to be in your life, which is your authority and your love. I love this. I don't have it on the screen. Uh, John Piper, who is a pastor that, that kind of got well known for preaching on missions and the glory of God, he was asked very early on in his ministry, back in like the 90s, uh, there was this uh, kind of um, l- less young people were going into the mission field. I don't know what the word is for it. Less uh, teenagers and college students and young adults were going to take the gospel to the nations. And they asked John Piper, they said, what would you do? Like, how do you fix this? How do you get people to care about the mission of God in the world? And I love what he said. He said this. He said, if you want to ignite a passion for the nations, start by igniting a passion for God. So church, if you in your heart go, man, I want a passion for joining God in his mission in the world. Start not by igniting a passion for that. Start by igniting a passion for Jesus whose glory in the world is worth it, who is the true and better Jonah, who came on the cross to show I have authority over all things, including Satan, sin, and death, as the greatest act of declared love the world has ever seen on behalf of sin and sinners. So if you're like, man, I I just, I want to be about this and I'm just struggling, then let me encourage you in all things and including this, look at Jesus. Look at the Christ. So what I want to do as we close Uh, Before the band comes back up, I'm going to pray, and I just want to give us a few minutes to do just that, and I want you to sit with just a couple of questions. Uh, Two questions. I'll just give us a few minutes uh, before the band uh, leads us in one more song. I just want to kind of leave you with these two questions. The first is this, where or who are the Ninevehs God is sending you to? Who are the people that you've written off as outside the mercy of God? Who are the people that you've written off as, as not, they're not going to accept, they're not going to believe. Here's the reality. Every Christian is a sent one. Every Christian is sent by God. Some of us, I think, we haven't talked about this much. Some of us are going to be called to go far. We're going to be called to go across the country, across the world. We're going to be called to cross oceans. All of us are going to be called to cross our street and to cross the cubicle and to cross the hallway. And so where's the Nineveh, right? Maybe it's not your enemy. Maybe it is your enemy. <laughs> Who are the people that you're like, nah, they're outside the mercy of God, that God is saying, no, that's the very person I want you to reach. And second, does God have your yes? Does God have your yes? There are two people in your life who will have your unreserved yes, your authority and your love. Is God your authority? Does he have your love such that if he calls you to go, hey, walk across the street, tell your neighbor about Jesus. Hey, go to that awkward coworker, tell him about Jesus. Hey, move overseas, tell people about Jesus. Does he have your yes? So you have your yes. And so let me pray just to kind of get us into this mode. The band's going to come up, play a little behind just to eliminate distraction. And then I'll come up again and lead us in communion in just a minute. Let me, let me pray and then just give you time to sit with these questions. Lord, thank you for who you are. God, thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us. And thank you for Jonah. God, I take so much encouragement in the fact that you include in your plan really rebellious, stubborn, hard-hearted people. Because you know, I can be very rebellious and stubborn and hard-hearted. 
So it's deeply encouraging, God, that your mercy extends even to Jonah, and it's deeply encouraging that your mercy extends to the Ninevites. And we need your grace. It's your grace that comes to us, that calls us your own, that washes us clean and makes us new and brings us into relationship with you. God, it's your grace that does that, and it's your grace that then turns us around and sends us out as ministers of reconciliation. God, and so I pray that you in your kindness would help us to see you in all of your glory and all of your might and all of your goodness and all of your worth itness. God, because there's no mission if we don't get your glory. So we need to see your glory. We need that to be the propeller that pushes us to join you in the work you're doing in the world. Lord, your kingdom is at hand. Your kingdom is near. You are working. You are saving. God, I just want us to have the privilege of being a part of that. So would you use us? Lord, give us clarity. God, show us who or where are the Ninevehs as we pray to you. you and to want you to rule and to reign more than approval, more than power, more than comfort, more than control, these lies that promise us all the things offered to us fully in you. Would you be our king? Would you be our savior? We love you. Praise you in Christ's name. Amen.